So welcome to Punjab in Covent Garden. It's really lovely that you've made it here today. It is super freezing outside and I'd like to let you know it's even colder down here. But don't worry, we'll get through it. Um, we're going to be here for about an hour celebrating the launch of a new album and in fact Kuljit Bamra's first ever solo tabla album. Yay! <laughs> a Tabla Nauts Journey is the title of the album. You have copies uh, on the chairs that you're sitting on. Um, uh, in fact, you've got copies probably in your hand at the moment. And uh, the artist uh, that um, designed the front cover or did the caricature of Kuljeet is actually here with us today as well, Alban Lowe. Uh, raise your hand, Alban Lowe. That raise yourself, even. <laughs> so, Kuljeet, uh, apart from being an MBE and a tabla nought, is a producer, a musician. In fact, he's regarded as one of the leading percussionists in this country with regard to not just uh, Asian, South Asian percussion, but other types of percussion as well. Um, he's the founder of Kader Records, uh, which has been one of the most important record labels within, um, within British Asian music. Um, and Kader has played home to um, lots and lots of incredible artists. Um, one of the things that struck me about Kuljeet when I first met him in 1991, 92, um, was the fact that he, uh, on that occasion, had George Michael Stubble. <laughs> he was a, he's a really good-looking guy. He still is, I mean, but back then he was <laughs> an even better-looking guy. And, um, but also, it was the fact that you had recorded with lots and lots of Asian women. Um, and you were the first British Asian producer that I met that had bothered to do that. Um, and it, it means that your, your kind of, your, your, your backlog of music um, is, is, is very unique in that, re in, in that respect as well. So, um, with regard to the album, A Tabla Nauts Journey, um, it's turned out to be something of an autobiographical album. Um, was that intentional? Or did it just kind of unfold that way? Yeah, I mean, it was something that sort of came to mind during the lockdown period. And um, it's interesting with Dublin, isn't it? Because normally you don't really, th you think of it as a, well, I think people think of it as a drum. And then then what follows is drum, drum, it's, it's, drum is not music. Drumming is not music, is it? It's just sort of a noise. <laughs> um, and then I, I wanted to um, ex extend my tabla kit to include more tablas. <laughs> And then I thought, oh, I can make little tunes. So every every sort of tune does um, signify a moment in my life. Um, and I've probably got to that age where I've I've become quite reflective and and wondering, you know, what what's going on, sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it it was uh, it was deliberate, and uh, it, and um, as I say, each each sort of moment or chapter in my life that I look back back upon, I, I sort of expressed in. Um, melody and rhythm of the tabla. Um, why did it take you this long to produce <laughs> a solo album <laughs> that is actually focused on your main instrument? Because this is the instrument you started off with, mm. right? Is it or isn't it? Oh, it is, yeah. I mean, I dabbled in lots of instruments when I was a kid. So I played a bit of keyboard, a bit of guitar, a bit of violin. But um, tabla is the thing that really caught my fancy. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I don't know why it took so long. Um, in fact, I, I would argue that a lot of the Bangra stuff that I've done is, all, is, is rhythm driven. And, and perhaps the reason for the success of my Bangra songs is, is the punchy rhythm. But um, it's only working with, you know, in my current company, Keda Music, we're, we're sort of demystifying Indian music and uh, making Indian music more accessible, Indian drumming in particular. It's only now that I've begun to realize, um, for me, how important it is to bring this instrument into, a, into other realms of music. Um, and so, uh, you know, since, since I was in Bombay Dreams in the West End, 
Um, I realized, I mean, the double A is an amazing instrument, which is why I love it. But it's also um, can be very limiting because, you know, uh, first of all, you need to spend 15 minutes tuning it with a little hammer. And then once you've tuned it, it goes out of tune with the temperature and the humidity and the stage lighting. Um, but in Bombay Dreams, I realized the limitation because unlike Indian classical music, where the whole performance is in one key. So if, they, if you watch a sitar recital or a gazelle recital, normally it's all in one key. So it might be in C or C sharp or D, um, in which case the doubler player would bring that one particular tuning of drum, a C, this is my C drum, and then I'll do the whole concert. But in Bombay Dreams, every song was in a different key. So I, I sort of had 12 doublers on the floor and I was juggling doublers and like, oh my God, change to this one, change to that one. And by the time I'd picked them up, they'd gone out of a tune. So um, I, uh, I then ended up, when I started to play with Andy Shepard in the jazz world, I ended up with all my doublers on a little shelf next to me, just like I have now, ready to, to play. And um, in one jazz solo that I was doing with Andy, I thought I could just play I could play them all <laughs> at the same time. And I thought, wow, I can make, I can make a tune out of doublers. And so I think there's a lot more to doubler than meets the ear or meets the eye. Um, nothing, nothing against the traditional way of playing, but I just think the instrument has much more scope. Um, if, you, if, you, if I ask you to imagine a doubler player, most of you would probably imagine an Indian man. It wouldn't be a woman. And I know some people say, oh, I know one woman. I said, yes, I one woman. Uh, or, no, no, I know one Englishman. He plays yes, one Englishman. But generally, it's an Indian man playing tabla. And most likely, it would be very amazing and fast and complex and, and enthralling, you know, amazing. Um, I, I just think um, sometimes the music gets lost in the, in the, in the sort of showing off of it, if I, could, if I can call it that. So I began to devolve my playing in a way, and, I, and just, I mean, just doing that is enough for me, you know what I mean? That, just says a, that says a lot more than playing a thousand notes a second. Um, and so I think to answer your question in a very long-winded way, um, it, it's the right time for me, having explored Tableau with Kaden Music and with, with Graham and Phil here, um, that I could actually, um, I was now ready to create that new world of sounds with Tableau rhythm and melody yeah i mean um <laughs> okay <laughs> what was the question yeah that was like a a four decade answer to a uh, question about the why well, it's taken four decades and and oh, plus uh, counting to create the double solar album um but thank you <laughs> so really you've you've pointed to where some of that journey across the last 40 years took you, way, way out of the Bhangra scene, way out of the British Asian music scene, um, you know, uh, working on, I think the Ramayana was one of the first yes. stage musicals that you, you worked with, yeah. if I remember right. The National right. Theatre with Indu Rupa Singham, yeah. yeah. Ramayana at the National Theatre. Because yeah. I remember yeah. that being, yeah, quite a big turning point for you when it happened. Yes. Um, and then, of course, after that, I think, came Bombay Dreams with Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yeah. Uh, and then you did Bargy on the Beach, the, the yes. theatre musical. Um, ben Delight Beckham. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sorry. Uh, that, no, maybe a bit. No, you're right. It was, okay, yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> We're losing our memories. Yeah, That's yeah, another. Sorry, yeah. Who were you again? Oh, yeah. That's the other criteria for I being an MBE. Uh, ben Delight Beckham. Ben Delight <laughs> Been to like Beckham, yeah. It's, in it's interesting because I always, I always. Well, Bargy on the Beach, that was the film. You, that was you the did film. a bit That's of the yeah, soundtrack. Yeah, sorry, I beg your pardon. Yeah, 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 that was correct. But yeah. no, fair enough. <laughs> Bend it like Beckham <laughs> in the theatre. Yeah. Charing Cross Road. If you say so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, the it was the Shaw's Shaw's the theater, that's right. The theater. Yeah, 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 the musical theatre, yeah. Uh, actually, it was what, what occurred to me was um, after doing the National Theatre, uh, Ramayana thing, because I didn't know what, uh, actually some of my friends know this, but I didn't know, um, so I was playing with Andy Shepard at Dean Street Pizza Express, and there was a woman in the audience called Sylvia Addison, who's a fixer, so she, she's someone who books musicians for theatre shows. And she was sitting in the audience, and she came up to me after dinner, and she said, "I want, I want to book you for a show." And I said, "Great." So I now I'd never done a, a I, I I'd never been to the theatre before, like a musical, and so um, 
I, I thought she, she, I thought she was booking me for one show. So we, we were rehearsing like crazy, and I thought, well, this is like really unnecessary, you know. But anyway, um, and uh, it, it uh, you probably know the story, but then it, I, I found out afterwards that it, it wasn't just, it was going to be eight times a week, the same show. Matinees and all. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and also, as you know, Indian musicians are not, I mean, generally speaking, Indian musicians are trained to improvise. They're not trained to play exactly the same thing every, every day. And so you can't suddenly go to the actors, hang on a minute, I'm going to do a 10-minute solo. Uh, everything's got to be precision to the second. And so that, that was another challenge in playing tabla um, in a musical, because you have to be precise, which is, again, not a tabla way of thinking. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, I mean, the point I was trying to make is, leading up to this album, A Tabla Nought's Journey, you will have had to break the rules, break convention over and over and over again because of this broad spectrum of experience of playing in different settings, um, working with you know Western music, like non-Indian men musicians, <laughs> um, doing eight shows a week in a th in a theatre production, matinees and all. Uh, and then, of course, you went on to found or create or innovate or invent even uh, the electronic tabla, which has gotten around your tuning problems, hasn't it? It has indeed, yeah. I mean, it's really exciting because we launched that in India in March next year. And um, that's very exciting. It's, again, it's like inventing an electric guitar for guitarists. It, it is, uh, you know, it takes a bit of getting used to, but at least if you're a tabla player, you're already there. But the beautiful thing about the electronic tabla is that it doesn't scare people off. I think tabla scares people. If you watch a tabla player, you probably think, he's amazing and there's no way I can do that. Whereas I think if you watch maybe a guitarist or an oboe player, you might think, oh, I really like the sound of that. I'm going to learn to play that. Whereas I think our virtuosity and flair and that showmanship, I think it pushes people away. So I think that's what I was referring to earlier on when I said I've sort of devolved as a tabla player because I actually I enjoy playing just sing, you know just that, and um, that has a certain beauty to it I think. So you've also invented a notation system as well, haven't you? Um, which came about because of working in musical theatre. Yeah. Again. So that's uh, you know yeah I, I know what I was going to say because um, you described me as breaking rules and I, I I don't consider myself rebellious in that way I mean I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm someone who says I'm going to rebel and break rules but I think I've been lucky enough to be in a position where I have to question like the traditional way of playing and I've been really lucky with that so um, so yeah so working in theatre for example as I mentioned before you have every show has to be exactly the same so when Andrew Lloyd Webber booked me for Bombay Dreams, um, and I realised it was going to go on for more than one night, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they said, we need, you need to find deputies. And I said, well, no, I'll, I'll do every show. And they said, well, no, we, you, you can't. It might go on for 25 years. I said, no, I, honestly, I'm, you can rely on me. I will do, I'll do every show. And they said, no, we don't want you to do every show. And I said, well, that's... That's a bit rude, but, uh, <laughs> but what they meant was, we, you know, you need to find a deputy. And so I thought, okay, n I n so the challenge then came, how do I find another doubler player who, first of all, is not going to sit on the floor cross-legged, and there's nothing wrong with sitting on the floor, but if you're going to play a taiko drum and then a snare drum and then a gong, it's a bit awkward to sit on the floor. So I've got to find someone who's going to sit on a chair and someone who's going to play exactly the same thing that's required in the show. So then I had to develop a notation system, which, uh, in fact, people will be surprised to hear this, but you know, if, you, if you're learning the recorder or the guitar, you can go to a shop and buy recorder music and play it. There's no tabla notation system which is universally understood. Now, there are notation systems, and people, certain schools, garanas, have their way of notating it, but they're not universally understood. So, as you know, you know, this, the, the verbal mnemonics of tabla, like da, 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 na, and they're, they're quite uh, amazing to watch on stage, but I don't think they're of any use to someone who's not Indian. I mean, uh, when I'm in school, 
and I'm teaching someone like this is called G, and then someone will say, well, how do you spell that, sir? And I say, well, I, I don't know, because it could be G-H-E, or it could be G-E, or it could be G-E-H. So there's, there's lots of things to sort of you know, work on. So I, I developed this notation system. It started very simply um, so that my deputies could actually play the same thing. So one of them uh, could, couldn't read any form of instruction. And in fact, a lot of instruments, you can't read a notation while you're, like, you know, Santur, for example, you have to look down and play all these. You can't read notation at the same time. So they're not, they're not designed for that. Luckily, with a doubler, you can have something in front of you. Um, so I, my, my deputy, um, I said, look, what you do is you, you play for six bars, and then you don't play for four bars. And he said, um, why? Why? Uh, <laughs> why? I said, well, no, I, I said, it's nothing personal. It's just that the composer doesn't want, you know, not you, he doesn't want anyone to play for four bars. He said, no, I'll play something really good. <laughs> I said, no, it, it's, it's not about that. So um, he said, no, no, trust me, I'll do something. Spe I said, no, but let's not play. Think of it this way, we're going to get paid for not playing those four bars. <laughs> so that's the only way I could, I could say. So, you know, when I was sitting here, sitting watching him do his first show, I just went, and he went. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, because, because you can't explain, it's very difficult to explain to somebody. And if you think of tabla playing, um, if you watch a tabla player, there's no space. Again, nothing rude about it, but the whole space is filled up with notes. And it's very impressive and very wowing, but there's no space in between. And do you, do you know how many double plays I've had to shut up when, <laughs> when, um, when they've been working with my bands? Oh, uh, you know, know. Yeah. and, and I've, 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 you know, I've had to say, no, no, I don't need you to play over that next four bar section. Can you just like leave it blank and don't play anything because we need that drop to have effect. Yes. And they're like, and you know, you get on stage, you know, um, in front of hundred thousand people, whatever, and there they are, happily playing away through that four bar drop. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, no, because, and again, it's, again, I don't want to make tabla players sound like evil or bad. It's just, it's not in the tradition. So that's a tr now you don't have to do. The thing is, if you learn, if you go on YouTube and, and look at a tabla solo, ninety percent you're gonna, the chances you're gonna find up find someone who's playing dintal like a 16-beat cycle, then they're going to be playing really fast, it's going to be a guy. So that's a traditional way, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but it's not the only way of playing doubler. And it's interesting, because if you, in England, because now I teach at the Guildhall, in England, if you say you want to become a jazz um, drummer, so what you would do is you'd find a jazz drummer teacher. If you wanted to become a folk musician, you'd go to a someone who inspired you from the folk genre. But, but in, Indi in the Indian world, you know, and I, I might be wrong about this, but from what I've seen in the Indian world, if you want to learn, if, wherever you want to go, you have to study through the classical route. Jay, Jay Vispadeva is here. Welcome, Jay. And, uh, and so, and Jay knows this, but it, you know, so you have to study through the classical route, then you can go off and do what you want. But even then, you still have to sort of keep your peers, your classical peers happy. So, um, the, you know, tr tradition has to change, doesn't it? Tradition is not, I mean, it, it's not stuck. It didn't fall out of the sky. Ch tradition always changes. And so, and it stays the same at the same time. And that's a weird thing to say. So, um, yeah, so that, that traditional mindset of playing really fast and very wowing and impressing, and it's uh, brilliant, that doesn't work in, in a theatre in the West End. It doesn't work at all. And so then the question arises, if somebody, if I booked my deputies to, do, to come and do the show, they probably would get bored after day two because they're not getting the acknowledgement from the audience that you get in an Indian environment and they're not getting the, the appreciation that they would normally get in a classical concert. So they would, um, I think they, would, they wouldn't survive. They would resign pretty quickly. They'd resign pretty quickly, mm. yeah. They'd resign pretty quickly. Mm. Okay, so... Um, Again, in terms of your breadth of experience, um, and it, well, it seems to me you've you've got an almost three sixty degree overview of the tabla now, right? There's the Western notation system. There's the electronic tabla invention by you. Um, 
there's all the albums that you've produced for so many other people. And there was a solo one by you as well, wasn't there? There was. Well, a double solo? Yeah, no, n not not a double solo album. It mm. was the it was the one with the red cover with you upside down on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, confusion. It was called that one. Yeah, yeah. no one understood it. But um, I loved it. Yeah. I played it on my show all the time. You know, well, and oh no, you did. Yeah, gigs. But there's no there's no double solo in that. But that was that was my first solo True. album. Sorry, beg your pardon. True. Yeah, that was an album called Confusion. My br my brother designed the sleeve, so he put my photograph upside down, and then it said Confusion. So the idea was that people would go. And I, my, I think my, a lot of my aunties rang my mum and said, they have made a mistake with the four pages <laughs> upside down. I said, no, 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 it is upside down. It, it really is. I said, no, I, I know it's deliberate. But uh, anyway, yeah. Speaking of aunties and your mum, do, do, do you find that they congratulate you on your MBA <laughs> yeah. instead of your MBA? Do you get that? Yeah, 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 yeah. God, all the time. <laughs> the MBA club over here. Yeah. Business, master of business, you know, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, well done on MBA, well done, yeah. <laughs> so now that you've got this 360 degree overview of the doubler, this feels like the right time to actually do a solo doubler album, I would say. Sure, yeah, I think, and, and that's, that's why I did it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> So let's, let's concentrate on some of the tracks that are on the album, because people here won't have actually heard it yet. Uh, they've only just you know, got a copy in their hands. Um, before we do that, so the album clearly is going to be on CD. Which other formats are you going to release it on? It's on all other formats. I mean, it's on the normal streaming platforms. But the CD gets launched tomorrow. Yeah. OK, and it's coming out. Oh, the album out. gets launched tomorrow, sorry, yeah. And it's coming out on Keda Records, That's right, yeah. your your label, yeah, which was set up back in 1986. Mm -hmm. I think so, yeah. That's one date I do remember. Yeah, 1986. Why? I mean, apart um, from the fact that yeah, you gave birth uh, to your own label, but yeah, because Keda, it was um, it's when I met my because Keda was an acronym, or well, it still is actually, but what, actually now it's changed because of Keda Music. But Keda is uh, was originally called Jit SM David and Alan. So it's the four four of us, um, and then more recently, um, seven I think eight years ago, we I then set up Kaden Music. Speaking of uh, names and titles, um, why a Dublin Nauts journey? I mean, it's a bit Star Trek, isn't it? It is a bit Star Trek, actually. Yeah, it's um, a bit NASA. You know. I think I think because of my slight my slightly nuttiness in my mind. Oh, naughtiness? No, that's not right. But that's another pun. But I think I, I think well, obviously it's, it's astronaut, isn't it? So I've always because of my e exploration of Dabla and my sort of curious, inquisitive nature, um, I always think I'm exploring new worlds. I mean, one of the things you know on a, on a tabla normally, you know these black spots. I don't know if you can see them at the back. These black spots on the on the bigger drum, the black spots not in the middle normally. Now, I've asked like a hundred people in India, why, why isn't that spot <laughs> in the middle? The other one's in the middle. And um, it, my engineering brain says to me that it should be in the middle because that's how it, it would vibrate and produce a pure tone. Why is it not in the middle? So I've never been satisfied with the answers that I've got. So, um, you know, people say this. This is the way we've done it, and this is the way we'll always, always do, do it. it. <laughs> yeah, and I said, no, I get that, but why is it not in the middle? And so um, it sounds better. I said, well, I don't know, is that because I had one made by um, Saki Hussain's doubler maker in, in India. This this one was made actually by Hari Das, and I said to him in Mumbai, can you make me a doubler? Yes, sir, no problem. I want the spot in the middle. Why? <laughs> I said, just look, it's fine, I'm going to pay you. If it goes wrong, it's not a problem. So I put the spot in the middle, and it sounded great. And now, now he makes ones with spots in the middle. So I, I, my, I think my curious nature, um, I always want to know why. Why, why, why? Annoying question. Um, so I, I consider myself a sort of astronaut of tabla. Tabla naught is where the word came from. Yeah. I mean, to me, um, the title points to you as an innovator. And, and and an inventor and somebody who f who trailblazes and has always done that. So I think it's a great title for the album. So maybe let's have a listen to the title track of the album first of all, a little bit off that. And you can tell us about um, what memories putting together this track evoked for you. 
because that's part of the auto autobiographical aspect to the album as well. So th this is called, it's a title track called The Tablet Notes Journey, and it's deliberately done to make you feel like you're in space. So it is a bit like the way you heard it. Um, again, it's exploring the tonality of the tabla rather than the complex rhythm patterns. So, and I think if you're in space, there's not a lot of reference points. You're sort of just lost. 360 degrees and so this track um, is really about that it's about just exploring and being being totally free to explore which is why it, it sounds like that <laughs> do you sit up late at night instead of looking at the stars <laughs> and kind of explore on your tabla it's, uh, I very rarely play my tablas at home which is a strange thing um, except if I'm recording but I certainly sit up late at night thinking random things. <laughs> so I know whenever we've been on tour together, um, you know, you've actually been not one of those musicians that, um, that kind of wears your musicianship on your sleeve all the time. Uh, you know, if you think of the rappers that we've been on tour right. with, the ones that rap in their sleep and nobody wants to share a hotel room with them. <laughs> those kinds of people. You were never one of those. Everyone was happy to share with you because they knew that you wouldn't get the doublers out at five in the morning. Or well, worse, nine in the morning. Yeah, and I think it's, it's interesting because I, I always say to myself, like, if I practiced every day like a lot of musicians do, I li I'd be really good. <laughs> I mean, I know that sounds that sounds a bit strange, but I'd be like really, I'd be really, really, really good. But I don't think that's necessary, like in this particular episode. Um, but I can, uh, I can sort of sometimes I lie in my car for like two or three days, and then and then I'll just play them at a gig. Um, obviously, I'll prepare to some prepare for some gigs. I mean, I had a concert on Sunday with London Symphony Orchestra at the Barbican. Um, I had to prepare for that, but I didn't prepare much. I sort of know what I'm going to do, and then my fingers do the rest. So I, I don't know if I don't I don't think I control my. Okay, let's not go there. Um, I don't think I control my fingers. Um, anyway, yeah. I think my feet. I, I, mean, I, I don't know. Do you control your fingers? What? At the best of times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes. Do you know how you control? I mean, do you know how you do that? I don't know how I do that. But anyway, what I'm saying is, it, it's. It's a natural, playing tabla for me is easier than talking. Because with talking, you have to find words and, and be polite and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> but uh, with, 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 with sounds, you, you just, uh, I, 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 they affect me more than, um, than words in a way, even though I love words. So, so with the track on the album, uh, which is more about, I suppose, Bhangra music, um, the track is uh, the big Bhangra theory. The big, well, I, I know, hearing it how you would pronounce it, the big Bhangra theory. Um, tell us about that, that particular piece of music. Yeah, I mean, that really celebrates the fact that um, Bhangra, or Bhangra, how you, how you pronounce it, is actually a British invention. So um, Bhangra dance obviously comes from the Punjab. Um, but Bhangra music as a genre was, is a UK invention alongside fish and chips and chicken tikka masala. So that, that, um, that's, that's, that's interesting to me because, because see, if, if I was born in India and I did the normal traditional route of being a musician, I don't, I don't think Bhangra music could have been invented in India because 
because of that bubble we spoke about earlier on, they, um, I think the, when you're in England, you can sort of look at your heritage culture from a different viewpoint. And so, um, so this track celebrates um, the fact that the Bhangra music as a genre is a British invention. So say when you were performing with Bhangra bands, you would have had to practice beforehand when you were doing that, no? Not really. Or did your fingers just kind of do the walking, <laughs> as it were, then as well? Yeah, but you see, Bhangra bands, they all sing in a Bhangra rhythm. So you don't need to practice the Bhangra rhythm. That's one of them. That's one of them, yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously, there's no, there's no doll in there, so it might not sound Bhangra, but that's the Bhangra rhythm. But if you, were the, you see, the advantage of working in a band is, say you've got five or six people, maybe ten people, you can all communicate with eyes. So you can go, okay, let's do that again, let's stop. Blah, blah, blah. Whereas you can't do that with a hundred-piece orchestra, or you can't do that in the theatre. So um, you, you don't need to practice. And also, here's the other thing, a lot of Indian musicians are also composers in their own right. So if we take Ravi Shankar or Anushka Shankar or another virtuosic, virtuosic performer, they are the performers and they are the composers of their own work. So they can make it up as they go along. Whereas if you think of a, of a sort of uh, a Western musician that plays in an orchestra, they are not the creators of that piece. They are playing Beethoven or Mozart or whoever the composer is. So they're really brilliant at taking someone else's imagination and expressing that. Um, in which case, you do have to practice a lot because people expect it to sound a particular way. Whereas in a band, Bangra band uh, or another band, you, well, especially Bangra band, you've got, you've got one rhythm. I mean, there's going to be fills and breaks, but you can all look at each other and go, duh, 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 stop. Uh, or yeah, start again. <laughs> so, but um, yeah. So I don't know. You don't really need to practice for that. I, mean, I actually, uh, again, uh, it's. Um, I, I sort of, in the back of my mind, think I should have practiced more in my life. But now that I look back on what I'm supposed to be doing, I don't think it was necessary. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway. Did you did you have fun making the album? Yeah, I had a lot of fun. I, I think. Um, I make sure I have, well, I think a lot of my friends know this, but I, I make sure I have fun a lot of the times. I know sometimes might people think people might think I'm a bit childish or silly or whatever, but I think my, if you're, you know when you, we play music, don't we? We play music, we don't work music. So you, you play, don't you, in a way, and, and that play requires courage or it requires a bit of risk taking because you could make a mistake, couldn't you? So um, yeah, so I, I have, I do have, I make sure. I'm not sure if I work at having fun all the time, but I, I know people that know me know that I like to have fun a lot of the time. And also, I think, um, I think the fun gets recorded. I know that sounds a weird thing to say, but because um, I've worked with bands in a recording studio where everything's really perfect and um, precise but there's no soul in there. Whereas you could have a, I'm looking at Dylan actually, because Dylan Gallagher's here, who's, who I think we reworked together on, on one of the first... Rail Gaddy. Rail Gaddy, amazing. So, wow. so, you, yeah, so Dylan recorded that. Lovely to see you. So um, I, think, I don't know if you agree, but sometimes in the old, nowadays we, we have this word called producer, who's, some, you know, I'm being a bit rude, but it's someone with a laptop that knows how to operate loops. A bit rude. But in the old days, a producer was somebody who managed the space in a room. So, sorry, someone upset? Well, yeah. Graham, <laughs> Graham's got a laptop. Yeah. Graham. Yeah, nothing personal. So, um, yeah, uh, but in the old days, a producer was somebody who managed the space in a room. And, you know, I worked with Gurdas Manwin, the Kapoor, 
I remember Gurdas Man rang me once and said, I can't do the session, you know, I had booked, the, my studio was booked, the musicians were booked, and he said, I can't do it, I'm not feeling great. I said, well, cancel it. Because if the love's not in the room, it, it's not gonna, so you can have lots of mistakes, and if there's love in the room, I know it's a bit corny, but if there's love in the room, it gets recorded. And if you listen to old records, y you, you can feel that, can't you? Whereas something, nowadays, computers, computers are amazing, but the danger with computers is you sort of cut and paste, or you just model things on other templates. Um, and it's all precise and perfect and quantized and everything, and it probably has, many times for me, no soul. So yeah, I do have fun, and I had a lot of fun recording that, because also I was going, oh, I can do that. Oh, you know, I'm literally exploring while I'm playing. So uh, it was a lot of fun to do that, and I definitely will carry on doing that. Fab. A Dublin Noughts journey. So even the production of the CD has been uh, another set of discoveries for you. Let's um, hear some questions from you now. I'm sure that you've got many that you would like to ask Kuljeet. Cool I have a question. Can you tell me a bit more about um, the origins and why it's so popular. Yeah, so Real Good D, for those of you who don't know, Real Good D is like a huge, it's a song that I recorded in 1986, and um, it's still played at weddings today. So if you don't know what Real Good D is, and rail, as, as the name suggests, Real Good D means railway train. So what happened was I was, um, the record company at the time was um, Multitone Records, the record label, and I did a lot of records for them producing other bands. And so they said, there's a band called Chirag Pichan, and could you produce their album? And the singer in the band was a guy called Mangal Singh, who's still a very good friend of mine. And Mangal Singh, um, later on, after Real Goody, went to Mumbai and became a, a big superstar playback singer there because of Real, Real Goody was his passport. So I, by that time, 1986, I'd produced a few hundred <laughs> albums already, and I was already getting, beginning to get a bit bored with, with Bhangra music because if you listen to the lyrics of Bhangra songs, there's not a large bandwidth of uh, subject matter. It's usually about getting drunk and looking at women. <laughs> and, which is why I worked a lot with female singers, because there, there's more emotional scope there. So they, um, they said to me, can you produce this album? And I thought, great, Mungal sings voice. I love his voice, and we'll do it. And at that time, if you, that's a bit of a longer answer, but it, it's all important. Um, if you think of Bhangra music and development of Bhangra music in the UK, it sort of peaked around 1983, 1984, 1985, that sort of time. And it's because, I think, it's because we just had the disco era. So um, now when I was playing at weddings, which I played like five weddings every weekend with my family band, um, the men would be in the room drinking and celebrating, but the women would be in another room, which is really strange, right? So if you think about it now. Um, so my mother, who was singing, would, would say, this is not fair, we w come in the room and you can dance, which the men hated. So we would, now there wasn't a dance floor, but the men would have a few drinks and, and uh, do a few moves and then go back. Um, so my mum would say, come in and let's give the women a chance, because it's not fair. So by, um, by the time Saturday Night Fever had come out, 1979, people, wanted to dance. And when I went to Punjabi weddings, uh, a lot of the men turned up with white suits and black shirts. <laughs> uh, and some of you might remember some this. Some of the Bhangra bands had white suits and black shirts. It, it, all, and ca it all came from there. And hairy chests and yeah, medallions and, yeah, as well. Exactly. <laughs> and so it all came from like John Travolta, basically. So people wanted to dance, but people were still shy of dancing at weddings. Men didn't want to get too drunk in case the women got upset or their wives got upset. And then the women also were a bit afraid of dancing because that whole thing about women shouldn't dance and it's like a, you know, no one will marry her if she dances, you know, she's like a dancing girl sort of thing. So my, because my mum was there, she encouraged people to dance. And so by 1981, my mother had recorded a song called Gidda Pao Haram Dio Mar Marika, which is like, it would mean to come and dance. So that song became very popular. And the women then came in the, the room to dance but they would dance separately to the men. There was no mixing. And of course, I was watching this from the stage um, and getting them to dance. 
And so when this record came to me, I thought, we need a song which actually brings the men and women together. And uh, I knew that uh, in the Western world, they had the, um, the conga. You know the conga, the train yeah. dance? So I thought, we need a conga. And uh, so um, when Mungal came um, to my studio, and uh, he expected me to do this, these very sort of Bollywood-style productions, and in fact, Real Goody was the first Punjabi album with live string orchestra in it, by the way. So that introduction, digga 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 digga, that's, that's real violins. So um, I said it would be really great to do this song. And the, the lyricist who was in the studio at the time was a guy called Bal Sidhu. He was a doctor. And so he had, you know, in those days they had bleepers in case there was an emergency. His bleeper was going off in my studio. And I said, don't you need to answer that? And he said, oh, it's fine. <laughs> so um, I said, OK. Um, and I said, look, we, we, wanna, we should write a song. Um, and he said, what about uh, making a real good deal? I said, perfect. So he, um, he said, one minute. And he took, uh, out of his pocket, he took a pre prescription. He had a prescription pad, you know, doctors. And on, I've got a photograph of this. And he wrote the lyrics, real goodie, on this prescription pad. And so Mungal said, oh, what is this? Uh, it's a children's song. I said, Mungal, trust me. It will, honestly, I, I never know which song's going to become a hit, but uh, this, I've got a feeling, is going to become He said, no, this is a children's song, real goodie. I said, let's just do it, honestly. Um, and I convinced the record label, if, you, if anyone's got real goodie, the record, you'll know that on the front of the record, they're all standing in a line like a train. Like, there's no Bangra band that would ever do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I got the company to put this photograph on the front, in, and there was this train exhibition that was happening. Um, they all went there, and they stood in a line, mungled, thought that this was a stupid idea. Anyway, that song then became like a super hit. And then I saw with my own eyes at weddings, me, men and women were actually dancing together. And... Uh, and also, if you're making a conga train, you have to sort of, I mean, you don't touch the person in front of you, do you, but necessarily, but, uh, or unnecessarily, but, <laughs> but it, it's, uh, so it was great to see, um, you know, this happening. And that, that happened to be the song that brought people together. And now, if you think of a Punjabi wedding, you, you think of a dance floor, don't you? Straight away, there's a dance floor. So, yeah, that was, again, I... I, I don't. I don't take credit. You know what I mean. I don't take credit. I, I think I happened. I was there at the right time to do that. I don't. I can't say that oh, I did that. I don't really feel. Um, I mean, it was my idea, <laughs> but I don't feel uh, that. Um, I felt. I felt it was necessary at the time to do that. You know what I mean. And and it, and it worked. So that's one of the few times. There's only been two times in my life where I knew a song was going to be a hit, which is a strange feeling to have because you never really know. But that was one of them. And the other one was Sangeeta's album, Pyar Ka I knew it was, was going to be a hit, and they were. So, But now, I don't know. Uh, if you ask me how to make a rec hit record, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, But those were. Yeah. Which, uh, truthfully, though, there are a number of hit records that you have made. A, a Rail Guardi, of course, is, is a really important one. It's enduring popularity. It, you know, it's just, <laughs> I, I played it at the Boiler Room in, in August, you know, and had these twenty-year-olds all making out like a rail car, doing the you know the Indian version of the conga, as it were, um, in the uh, Bukhara Center. It was it was quite incredible, and you know it's been captured on camera, um, and it's one of the tracks that I've played at my clubs for over th over thirty thirty years. Uh, ditto with um, Gidda Bal, sung by your mum. Uh, it's the only only track that has been played at every single Club Kali for the last 28 Amazing. years. Wow. Amazing. So, um, and surprisingly, Bjarka Herbari is, has not lasted as well, but it was huge when it came out. And I think people were desperate, desperate for there to be some kind of, you know, South Asian female representation. And she delivered it beautifully, mm. as, as did you and, you know, the... the you know, the other people that were involved in making Flower in the Wind. Um, more questions. We don't have time for very many, so yes. Hello. Um, I just wondered, um, almost everything you've, you've done, you've produced, written, composed, has been with bands or with other performers. And this is obviously very different because it's just you. Was that a very different experience, recording it? Yeah, no, that's a very good question, actually. Um, 
I suppose, I think, um, actually, I was, I was thinking about this earlier when we were, we were speaking with Graham and, uh, and Ritu, um, about how, see, I don't, think I'm a, I don't think I'm a stage guy. And I'm, I'm not someone who has a desperate need to get out there and go, you know. <laughs> and, you know, you could, being a producer or a composer, you can hide behind the curtain, can't you? So I've, made, I've got hit songs. And actually, when people say to me, oh, there's this amazing song called Real Good D, you know, do you know it? And I said, yeah, I, I know it. <laughs> but but I, I, quite, I actually quite like that, because I'm, I'm, then I might choose to say, actually, I did that. <laughs> but I wouldn't, I wouldn't naturally say that. So it's quite easy to hide behind, um, behind a production. And um, also, bands, bands are sort of flavours in a way, aren't they? So there's some bands come and go, whereas I think composers or producers can carry on for quite a long time, because th they're the ones that take the hit, you know, <laughs> if it all goes down. So I've probably enjoyed being um, quietly um, proud um, without having to sort of get on stage and like, you know, bare my chest my hairy chest but um so yeah so making this album it is um yeah it's exposing but again um i think i think i i i had to do it and because i discovered something really beautiful about the tabla like all you need is an extra one of the small ones and you can make something really really amazing which so it, again i've um appointed myself as the person to to open that door. I mean, I think, I, I would imagine that many tablet players who hear this album might think, like, what, what, is, what is it? <laughs> he says, anyone can do that, which is, which is actually the point of it. Yeah. Because um, I want anyone to be able to play the tablet. At the moment, if you want to pick up these drums and learn to play them, you're under a lot of pressure, because you're going to have to, you have to be like the gurus that are out there. And that's a big pressure to have. If you buy a guitar, it's okay, you can sit in your bedroom and just strum away, even if it's not tuned and you enjoy it, that doesn't matter. But with tabla, sitar, there's a lot of pressure. And um, so that's why people don't bother. And even the people that do bother to play, they could spend 20 years learning to play tabla, and then they might not get a gig. So I think drums are so, you know, you just, you, you just need to hit them and you get a beautiful sound. Even if you just did that all night, uh, I mean, not all night, but <laughs> say, say you just did that. You, there's so much pleasure in that. So I, I think, to answer your question, uh, yeah, it is exposing. And, um, but I think I've discovered something that is, um, sounds nice. And, and also, people that hear it might want to pick up the tub and play. I mean, at the Barbican on Sunday, there was a queue of people in front of me saying, can we have a go, little kids? And I don't think that would happen in a classical concert, no. or the kids wouldn't be there in the first place, but um, I don't think people would come up and say, can I have a go on your drum? Because there's a sort of invisible um, barrier that's there normally. Again, nothing against the, the people. It's just that there's a sort of distance that's created between the public. So I want people to say, I want to buy one of those, and I'm, I'm going to go like this all night. <laughs> And that's enough for me. I don't have to play Dindal or like learn 10 million rhythms. So, yeah. You've, um, you've explained to us how you're really our master at democratizing the tabla. Um, do you think, and this is to tease something else out of you, do you think that that's to do with the way that you learn the tabla? Yeah, because I'm self taught. So I've, I don't even have a GCSE in music. Yeah, I've got an honorary doctorate in music and I'm a professor, you know what I mean? So it's really strange. But I've, I've, yeah, I've learned in the field. And that's why I said uh, earlier on that I didn't go out looking for this stuff. It came to me. Um, you know, Andy Shepard had different keys that he was playing in, so I had to have different tablers. There's no other way to survive. Um, so yeah, I think um, I've got a natural curiosity for stuff. And I just want, you know, that why, why, why question. So I think, yeah, you're right. Um, I've learned in my own way. And also, I'm, I want people to love this instrument. It's an amazing instrument. And uh, why not? Why, why is, it's 2023 and we've got AI and everything, but there's only Indian people playing Indian instruments. That's like ridiculous, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that 
I can't think of anyone else. I might, at a push, might think of one other person who believes the same way that I do. Um, but I, I, that's why I, it, it puts more, more of an onus on me to actually keep pushing forward like a soldier, even though I'm not that sort of a guy. But I, have to, I feel I have to do it, because otherwise people miss out on just having a bit of fun doing this all night, you know. <laughs> but, but how did you teach yourself? Yeah, I mean, okay, that's a good question, yeah. So way back when I was a kid, um, I remember being like, th I, I, I must have been three years old, but I, I can't believe that I can remember being three years old, but I, I must have been three or four. My mum was singing in, in temples, um, Shabbat's hymns in the temples, and, my fa and there were no tabla players around at that time to play with her, so my father began to, to study tabla. So I remember him... I remember watching him learning to play tabla. Now, he, he hasn't got a musical bone in his body. <laughs> and so he, he, would, he would be reading, like, you know, da, di, 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 and he'd play it. But by the time he'd played it, it was too late for the song. You know what I mean? And I knew he was making... I could see, I could see what he was doing wrong. And now I don't know how, you know, to answer your question. But I, when he left the room, I could go in and I could do it. And so... I don't know how I, I learned. I just, I've got this knack, I think, if you call it a knack. Um, you know my mum, she can, if she, got, if she eats food, she can tell what's in it. She says, oh, they put this much, they put turmeric, they put this, that, the virgin. I can do that with music. I, I could, so when I was about 13 or 14, I fell in love with this um, sort of Indian music in a way. I'd always loved Indian music. And it made me cry, actually, because I, I don't really cry nowadays. I think I've, sh I've turned the tap off. But um, I used to cry a lot, you know, listening to music because it moved me so much. So in my house, my mum had these, um, you know, the reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. So I used to, and then there was a tabla bit in there. So what I did is I used to slow it down. So I used to put it, it was like, I think, seven inches per second. I used to put it down to one and three-eighths inch per second. And it'd go... <laughs> and I could, I could see how they were, they were doing it. Um, then I'd cut, my, I'd cut the tape with a pair of scissors and then sellotape it together and make a loop out of it. And I was doing this when I was maybe 11 or something like that. And sometimes the loop was really long. So I'd have to, you know, I'd have to put it around a frame and then a doorknob and then, and then I'd put a pestle, uh, like a plasticine with a pencil in it and I'd, so that it wouldn't get tangled up. And then I'd play along with it. So, I, yeah, I just learned by watching and looking Actually, that's the answer to your question. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I wish I... I don't know the sort of logical answer. <laughs> but I, I, I just have that ability to sort of see how something's done. Here's, here's the arrogant part, uh, my arrogant answer. Um, when I can see how something's done, I can do it really well. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, no, that's uh, funny to me. But, yeah, I, you know, uh, but it could be anything. It could be cooking, it could be, like, carpentry, it could be, like, make, fixing a doorknob, or it could be... Um, brain surgery? Yeah, yeah, I could do brain, yeah. I mean, if I could see how, yeah, if I could see how it's done, I could do it, because, you know, I'd be really, I'd be really good with a, with a scalpel and sort of whatever. But I just have... Any I have those... Uh, <laughs> I just have the... I think that's why I was talking earlier about my fingers and my hands, because I don't think... Somehow they're connected beyond... They bypass my brain. And, and they... Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't... Anyway, yeah, I don't know. Um, that's how, But I learned by listening and watching, and I could tell how stuff was put together. I could, see, I could hear reverbs and delays. I can hear how it was EQ'd. I could hear what the... What the purpose of you see if you if you speak to a tab uh, again i'm generalizing if you speak to a traditional tabla player now for example i want and if you ask them a question what is the purpose of your the, of your sound in the performance i want i don't i don't think they know what you're talking about i mean i'm, I'm being i'm generalizing i think they would just say i'm playing really amazing stuff which you are but like i could i could see the purpose of each sound like where it, where it fits in the overall tapestry of the sound, like the drums. If you listen to pop songs, the drums aren't loud at all. I think a lot of people know this, but you know, but you think it's like, you know, in rock music they're not even loud. You might hear lots of cymbals, but you don't hear drum kit like you would sitting next to a drummer. So in a mix, it's got a very different 
purpose. And so I could, I could sort of see that. And then, I, and then I began to, again, I was in the right place at the right time, and I could experiment with it and, and, and get it wrong and get it right. <laughs> I mean, not everybody listens with such a discerning or dissecting kind of ear, though, do they? Which you, you clearly had all of the hallmarks of becoming a recording engineer straight away uh, as, a, as a child, you know. And also what you, the story you related about cutting and splicing, you know, <coughs> what would have been cassette tape or, well, no, reel-to-reel -reel tape back then. I mean, it, it put you in good stead for when you moved on to uh, quarter-inch tape and all the, all the other stuff that you ended up... Two-inch tape, one-inch yeah. tape, two-inch yeah, tape, yeah, two-inch tape. All of them. Yeah, I did all of them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but your mum must have really worried about you. I mean, <laughs> the rest of us were playing with Barbie dolls, action men. <laughs> You've done it all, cool, dear. Um, you know, you really have. But I would love to see you do the score for a Bollywood film. Um, is that ever going to happen? Yeah, I would love to do, and actually I have been asked to do score for, for Bollywood movies, but what happens nowadays in Bollywood is, I mean, generally speaking, is, um, as you know, there are, two, there are two parts of a Bollywood movie, movie film score. One of the songs, and the other one is the underscore music. So it's quite common nowadays that they, the underscore music is taken from library music, which is already existing and then they put songs. Now, um, I, if I do it, again, this is my sort of condition, that I'd like to do the underscore music and the songs, because the underscore music is actually what makes the songs, because it's happening underneath the dialogue and building you up towards it. Um, otherwise, they'll just put that ding, bong, ding, 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 you know, underneath the dialogue, and it, it sort of ruins the song. But yeah, I would love to do that, and, and that is sort of the one condition that I have. And um, Nowadays, it seems quite common that they'll have like two or three composers and they'll choose the songs. Um, I, I can't help thinking that Bollywood has this sort of quick, it's a quick turnaround money conveyor belt nowadays. They don't really make music like they used to. I sound like an old man, but they don't make songs that, that people could whistle in the bathroom. You know, no, it's all like house music and, or hip hop. And they'll, they'll make their money, recoup their money, and they'll have their watches and motorbike sort of endorsements. And then people will forget about it after a few weeks. So yeah, I would like to do it, and I'm probably choosy about you know which one I say yes to. But yeah, thank you. I would like to do that. I was having this conversation about the Bollywood uh, soundtracks just last night with a with an interviewer, and um, yeah, I mean the same investment is not going into the soundtracks anymore because they're not seen as um, being used to actually draw people to a film as much. Mm. Uh, and also, uh, you know, people are watching the movies, they're watching them quickly on their laptop and then gone, it's finished. It's not like the old days when they used to go and everyone used to kind of gather in the village and watch it on a big screen and, and all of that. So there isn't the same investment in uh, music directors. Well, all the big studios original. have gone in Bombay. So, and, and there's no orchestral music in Bombay. So it's very, when I go to India to record strings, I say, I want 22 strings, yes. Yes, we'll book two violins and dub them 11 times. Said, no, I don't want two 11s dub. You know, I want 22 people playing together. Yeah. It's different. No, no, it's the same, sir. It's, I said, no. It's, it's done on logic. Yeah. It's done on logic programs, exactly. isn't it? So. Keep talking about being in the right time, the right time and the right place. You talked a little bit about the right time, but for you, what was the right place and why is it so important to be in the right place? Yeah, I think... Um, Definitely being in England is the right place for me. Um, and I, I feel I'm one of the few people, again, arrogantly, one of the few people who can explain successfully how Indian music works to a Western audience. So, um, you know, I mean, this sound. Somebody says, what is that sound? And, and you know, I could say it's <laughs> Or I could say, well, it's, it's a, a semi-muted sound with a glissando. And then people go, oh, I understand that. So I think, um, again, it echoes back to my answer about Bhangra music. It could only have been invented here. Sometimes you have to step outside of the bubble um, to appreciate what the bubble is. And, and so I think England is, is the right place. I mean, Southall as well, you know. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I've been a Southall boy since 1968. And um, 
Southall's great, you know, it's like next to the airport. <laughs> and uh, it's got like, the M25, M4, you know, people come to Southall. And, and Southall is very uh, unique because, say, again, nothing against the other places. Say you go to Leicester or you go to like maybe Brick Lane, they're predominantly more of one particular culture, nothing wrong with that. But in Southall, I mean, it's such an amazing mix. I did an album a few years ago called Somali Party. So I work with Somali musicians, whereas I think other people might not want to do that. Um, so yeah, I think Southall's great because it's, it's got, you've got East European, Somalis, you've got Africa, Caribbean, Indian, Sikh, Gujarati, all, all different people together living happily side by side, just like they are in India, I think. And so I think Southall is perfect. Again, I didn't choose that. You know, my soul might have chosen it or whatever, but I think I've been at the right place at the right time to, be, to ask the right questions and also have the ability to be able to speak English in a certain way where I can explain it to maybe a five-year-old person or a postgraduate um, music student. So I think I am lucky to be in the right place at the right time. And I think it needs that, you know what I mean? It's, it's weird. You know, when I, when I say to people, there's no sheet music for Indian music, they say, what do you mean there's no sheet music? You can go out and buy the Beatles or Tchaikovsky. You can't buy... So why, why? it's really weird, isn't it? So it's strange in 2023 that we're at that place. But yeah, living in South... I'm, I'm a Southall boy, and I will probably end up dying in Southall. I mean, not soon, but well, who knows, you know? <laughs> but um, yeah, and so... Uh, but yeah, I, lo I love Southall. It's just a, an amazing place to be, and it's, it's, it allows me that whole mix of access. And of course, you set up the Southall Garana. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> which is one of the tracks on the album, yes. And it's going to be the one that you're going to see us out with, but could you yeah. tell us the story about, uh, about that particular track? Yeah, sure. And, and the I, full title. The full title. So um, some of you that don't know, when, when you learn music in India traditionally, you would um, find a maestro that you want to follow, like a guruji. Or t uh, you know, gu in India, guru means teacher, literally. So guru, gu means darkness, ru means light. So guru is someone who takes you from the who enlightens you, teaches you. Whereas in the Western world, guru is quite heavily loaded. You know, you just need to watch the film, The Guru, and you'll realize. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so you would, learn, uh, you would learn in India under a guru, and that guru would belong to a particular geographical district in India, and that's called a garana. Gar means house. So now, the f when you're in India and you're a tabla player or any musician, and you meet somebody and they say, oh, I heard you play tabla, yes. Uh, which next question is which garana do you belong to? Mm. Jay, Joe knows this very well actually. And in fact, Jay, you were you might have forgotten this story, but you were actually part of this story, so it might come come back to mind. So Navras recorded um, a lot of the Indian classical artists when they came to England. They recorded under the Navras label, and they used to usually many of them recorded at my studio. Yeah. And um, so many of the artists came to my studio because it was run by a musician, so he he would know how to make a good sound, which I did, obviously. And um, on this particular occasion, it was the, the renowned vocalist Bandit Jasrajji who came. I don't know if you remember this. And so Jay told me he's coming, booked the studio, and I opened the door, and he stood there very proud, very guru, Guruji-like, and he had his little entourage next to him. And I said, you know, welcome to my studio. And he said, yeah. And so, Jay, you said, this is Kuljit, the owner of the studio. And he himself is also a very good tabla player. I don't know if you remember this. <laughs> and so uh, then Pandit Jasraj looked at me and said, yes, very good. So which garana do you belong to? And I said, Southall. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, I don't think he got the joke. He was a bit unamused in this. So I said, come in, you know. But uh, he just went, uh, I got the head wiggle response, you know. So. But yeah, that's the story. So I, and, and I, um, uh, again, uh, Herakira's question, you know, harks to this answer in terms of um, I'm, a, I'm a Southall boy and I'm a, I belong to the Southall Garana. So that's one of the tracks on my album um, because I'm just Southall mind and cool your mind and everything and that's, that's who I am.
Cool tube. Bummer.